I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very honored to be part of this extraordinarily distinguished group of scientists. I want to thank Andreas and the city of Puebla and the extraordinary volunteers who have been taking very good care of the speakers during this experience. I particularly need to tell you that this talk that you're going to hear today is really dedicated to my husband, David, who um, I have to tell you, in many ways, the woman that you see standing here right now, I'm not really one person. I'm two people. You heard my husband David talk this morning about redirected aggression, and in many ways that was my talk. And today I'm going to be talking about the myth of monogamy, and in many ways that's his talk. We've been married for 32 years now, and the irony that a couple written the myth of monogamy has blended into a single individual is part of the miracle, I think, that I'm going to describe to you um, in, this, in this brief talk. So I need to tell you that being married to David has not always been easy. And in fact, being the author of the book, The Myth of Monogamy, has been dreadfully difficult at times, particularly when the book was first published in 2001, and reporters would come up to us and say, well, what about you? and clearly expect that because we wrote the book, The Myth of Monogamy, we had racy stories to tell them. We tried to tell the press that people could write books about giraffes who didn't have very long necks, or people could write books about fish who couldn't swim, but somehow that never seemed to satisfy them. So that's the first area of embarrassment that I've had to endure. The second occurred early in 2002 when the rock star from the band KISS, Gene Simmons, was being interviewed by Terry Gross on National Public Radio, the um, show Fresh Air. And it was a dreadful interview. It was such a bad interview that you can't find it on the logs of Fresh Air anymore. His lawyers asked for it to be taken down. But you can trace through and listen to this interview. And in it, Mr. Simmons um, badgered Terry Gross. He was obscene. He hit on her sexually. And finally, she said to him, Mr. Uh, Simmons, is it true that you've had 4,600 lovers? And he in uh, interrupted and said, so far. And she said, so far. And she said, why have you had 4,600 lovers? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, it's because I'm an M-A-N, a man. I just finished reading a book called The Myth of Monogamy, and it explains the whole thing. And at that point, our phone began to ring off the hook, and we thought, oh, no, this is not what we meant at all. Because Mr. Simmons committed the sin, I think, of what's called the naturalistic fallacy. He confused our descriptions of adultery and infidelity with prescriptions for what he should be doing. So I want to begin today by pointing out that smallpox is natural and vaccine ain't. It's a very simple way of saying that what you describe to be true is not necessarily good. Mr. Simmons needed to go back to college. So when David was courting me, and we were young, and it was early in the 1970s, this is what he told me as we walked and hiked through the Cascade Mountains. He told me the facts of life, that I had been wrong to think that men and women were different because they had breasts or beards or uteruses or penises or other things that we would think of. He told me that the real way that you tell a male from a female is by its sex cells. So that if you want to determine the sex, for example, of an oyster, and it doesn't have an innie or an outie, you can open it up and you can tell, does it make eggs or does it make sperm? And that's how you determine the sex of an oyster, or a tree, or any other living reproducing being. Males make sperm, a large number of very small sex cells. Females make eggs, a small number of very large sex cells. 
And what we know about male-female behavior derives from those fundamental differences in whether we make eggs or sperm. So you can look around you in the audience and you can see that even people who've had mastectomies or people who are young, who haven't reached puberty, or people who are postmenopausal, all of these people genetically are either male or female, and their behavior derives from whether they're egg makers or sperm bakers, at least insofar as biology influences their behavior. In, again, in the 1970s, a professor named Robert Trivers followed up with the logical extension of what it means to be egg makers or sperm makers. Men make sperm, which are large, um, which are, I'm sorry, a small number of inexpensive sex cells. So a man can make love in the morning and replenish his energy with a couple of potato chips in the afternoon and it really means nothing in terms of the cost of his life. A female, on the other hand, who makes eggs, has a much greater burden because if the female gets pregnant, she will suffer the consequences of being an egg maker. She'll undergo pregnancy, she'll produce a placenta, um, childbirth, and um, she'll have to take care of the baby. So for females, taking care of babies has been obligatory. What's important to know about sex differences is that the sexes have more in common than they really have in different, uh, that, that, that really different. First of all, what we know from many, many sources is that lifelong monogamy is no more natural to males than it is to females or vice versa. Males may be interested in a large amount of sexual variety, but females are as well. And we know this from looking at everything from anthropologic data to DNA fingerprinting. In fact, if you do DNA fingerprinting of human populations, we can find that somewhere between 0.4 and 30% of human babies are not fathered by the social partner of the mother. In other words, there's a parental discrepancy, as it's called something on the order of between 0.4 and 30% babies are fathered because the mother had an affair with someone else. Um, so we know both sexes seek variety, but they do it for different reasons. Men seek variety because it's fun, because they're interested in reproductive opportunities, sexual opportunities, and it's not difficult for them to have lots of sex with lots of partners. Females seek variety because it serves them. It helps them move up socially, and it can give them greater resources in terms of um, power, status, and money. Both sexes cheat. Neither sex has a, um, a, a monopoly on honesty. In fact, both sexes are probably equally inclined to cheat when it serves them. And both sexes experience intense sexual jealousy when they are betrayed. So we know, for example, that the most frequent cause of domestic violence um, in families is when a male either thinks or determines that his wife has been unfaithful. And that's a major cause of murder in, in all societies. I am a psychiatrist, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a scientist like some of the people who you've heard t earlier today, and I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers to justify this slide. I'm going to tell you that probably each of you has been affected by infidelity, and you've undergone broken hearts, you've undergone betrayal, you've been betrayed, you are a betrayer. You've probably felt um, extremes of lust and possibly what we call limerence, which is falling in love, the extreme experience of um, feeling that you found your perfect partner, but you've also been in the dumps when that perfect partner turns out to be not so perfect after all and has either betrayed you or let you down in some other way. As a doctor, I know that the most frequent cause of a 3 a.m. phone call in my private practice 
is when someone has discovered the wrong person in their bed. And people go crazy. They really, really literally go crazy when they find they've been uh, the victims of infidelity. For example, one woman I treated had, she was a perfectly ordinary middle-class housewife who discovered someone else's underpants in her lingerie drawer. And she became so enraged that she personally dragged all of the, um, at the mattress, the foundation of her bed, her dresser, every bit of bedroom furniture out to the front of her home where she doused it with gasoline and set it on fire. This is the kind of insanity that infidelity can create. And it's a homely example because no one was really hurt. No, there was, you know, the police were called, but there was, in fact, there were no blows exchanged. So infidelity leads to divorce, it leads to loss of child support, and it leads to post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly among those who've been betrayed. So I asked myself for this talk, well, remember the naturalistic fallacy that what's natural may not be good. So I'm going to try in some flights of fancy to describe for you some things ways of living sexually that are not natural, but they may be good in terms of reducing the amount of mayhem that infidelity creates. Remember, because I'm discussing these things doesn't mean I'm a proponent. So here are some unnatural sexual options that deter cheating, although um, they're dependent on both males and females having access to reproductive technologies, including contraception and DNA fingerprinting. So I'm just going to go down this list. These are some unnatural alternatives, and they're unnatural because they require honesty on the part of the individuals who are engaged in these practices. Polyamory is a movement that's become quite popular in the Northern Hemisphere. People who come together in sexual um, colonies who love one another and have lots of sex with one another, but they say that they're attached, they really care. They're not promiscuous because they're emotionally engaged. People say in the polyamorous movement, I love lots of people. Okay. Then there's ethical promiscuity. Those are people who say, I like lots of sexual variety, or as my friend Dosey Easton calls it, these are people who are ethical sluts. An ethical slut is someone who practices the strictest sexual hygiene in terms of preventing so sexually transmitted diseases and preventing unwanted pregnancy, but they also make no pretense of commitment or attachment they're very careful, for example, not to leave their designated partner at a party without a ride home. But that doesn't mean that they leave the party um, with the person they came with. Um, I commend Dosey Easton's book, The Ethical Slut, to you if you want more about that. There's responsible dating. People who say, I'm having sex with a lot of people with an eye to attachment. No problem here. Again, as long as you use condoms and, and contraception, it's ethical in the sense that it's honest. Serial monogamy is probably what people are doing here in this audience. I would bet that there are very few people here who've only had one sexual partner. What usually happens, even in cultures that are, seem to be committed to monogamy, is that people have uh, multiple sexual partners, but they do it one after the time, one after the other, often with adultery and dating in between. This would be more honorable if people would say, I'm yours until I change my mind. Then there's deliberate reproductive sex with DNA fingerprinting, and I know that this happens quite a bit in people who are using artificial insemination for um, or uh, in vitro fertilization because they've had fertility problems. It's also done in gay couples who very deliberately choose a, an individual to fertilize their own sex cells. It's done up front, it's open. Again, no dishonesty. And finally, I'm going to propose a deterrence theory 
of monogamy, which I call mutually assured monogamy, based on nuclear weapons theory. Mutually assured monogamy would be um, an educated take on fidelity and infidelity. It's a, it would be like a traditional marriage vow with the details spelled in and explicit. I will not have secret sexual relations with other people, even though I know I'm going to want to, because it will make you crazy. In exchange, for asking that you will not have secret sexual relationships with others because it will make me crazy. If you cheat, I may too. So this is a nuclear option-based marriage, if you will, that says that we understand that there's a tension between commitment and lust. And deferring a wish for multiple sexual partners is not an easy thing to do. There are advantages to monogamy. And just briefly, raising children together means that each partner is equally invested in the offspring because each person shares 50% of their genes. So it's easier to raise a child together than it is to raise stepchildren. It's easier to do estate planning if you're a lifelong monogamist or at least a serial monogamist who's <laughs> uh, with mindful breeding. Um, Estate development is easier if you know who you're sleeping with and um, where your investment is for the future. There's the friendship element of monogamy that's expressed, I think, in this talk, that as David and I have been together for 32 years, we blend together. We know how to share. When it's time to hang a, hang a door or fix a fence or figure out the taxes, we help one another, and we've been doing it a very long time. It's cheaper to be two together than it is to be um, one singly, although it's not twice as cheap. It's helpful to be monogamous because of the attachment and love. But I want to leave you today with the final reason that I think monogamy may have great value, which has to do with aging. As our population and as people grow to live to be longer, as we, as we heard uh, earlier, individuals can now live, expect to live to their 80s and 90s. Um, it becomes all the more important to be able to have a companion who can change your adult depends or help with your catheterization or help with finding your stairs or deal with your dementia care. This picture has been hanging on my kitchen wall for 30 years. And I didn't know at the time, this is a cartoon from a book called Papa Snap and Other No Such Stories. I didn't know at the time that David and I would turn into Mr. and Mrs. Limpid. I thought it was cute. I didn't realize that our infirmities would come to match one another and that we would become dependent and that this is what it would look like. And I think it's what it would look like. And I think it's difficult to become Mr. and Mrs. Limpid over the course of time, over the course of, of decades, if you have not, in fact, created an honest and enduring friendship. So I want to thank you very much, Andreas and the people here. And I wish you well. Mm -hmm.